Well, first of all, let me say good afternoon to members of the media. Uh, you, you see me flanked on my left by our former president, Brother Adabel Simmons, who served the BIU for some 20 odd years as president and also in the area as a union organizer. Uh, there are also other members here that are here today, and you will hear in a minute exactly why they are here. This year, 2015 marks 50 years of the Belco uh, riots of 1965. So we've put together a committee uh, made up of, of individuals to my left and to my right. Brother Adi uh, is, is the chair or co-chair of that particular committee. Um, so on February 2nd, which is in two weeks' time, two weeks from yesterday going forward, um, there is uh, an event that's going to happen here at BIU at 5.30 to 8. And I'll let Brother Adi and the other members of the committee speak to exactly what they're going to be doing um, over <coughs> on February 2nd. Who's talking? Adi's talking. Ron is giving instructions, Adi. Try to take an order. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, President Chris and colleagues. Uh, today marks the preparation day, I suppose, for the public with respect to what we're calling reflections of 1965, February 2nd. And that was an event that none of us are just able to forget, no ma matter how much you may try, how much dementia you may have. It is perhaps one of the uh, most outstanding historical events. It has, it takes in certainly uh, social, cultural, and uh, to some extent, uh, political twists and turns. And certainly a question of race is as an ingredient in the Balco strike, disturbance, riot. You have a list of words you could uh, refer to. It was a dispute between the Bermuda Industrial Union and the Balco hierarchy. And not only were they Balco hierarchy, uh, the directors were also some of the greatest knighted people in Bermuda. I think we were confronted at the time with some four to six knighthood people from that represent Front Street and all, not only the um, Balco, but other utilities in Bermuda. It was a season of monopoly for the uh, upper class of this country. Things changed after the Balco. They changed for the good of some of us. <coughs> and yet, the change was rolling on. It is not given equal opportunity equal rights, and it's never, and still not, without prejudice, it's sheer prejudice and discrimination. Uh, at the meeting on the 2nd of February, we intend to bring <coughs> out as many facts and as much information as we can with respect to the disturbance at Belco. Thank you. In response all? Yes. Yes. Um, on that occasion, on February the 2nd, Lieber. on February the 2nd, 1965, I was a police officer. And I would say that all of the participants on that site were confronted with a unique set of circumstances. The union was, in fact, challenging what one might say was unbridled power. And the idea of the union attempting to recognize and fight for their employees created some discontent from the other side. And then as far as it relates to the people involved, the police officers and the strikers, this was a novel experience for them. There had never been such a confrontational situation before. Police officers were both Bermudian and non-Bermudian, white and black. Now on the police side, there is something unusual because the vast majority of the English police officers 
generally stayed up at Prospect, a former um, military garrison. They had the police club where they socialized. And their interaction with the local community was relatively limited. And it was usually uh, in a case where people uh, had broken the law. On the other hand, the Bermudian police officers were confronted with that situation. And they were living amongst a lot of the people who were demonstrating. In my case, I was a police officer on one side, and I saw one of the strikers, a fellow member of the church choir to which we belonged. So we had that in common. I could recall a police officer who lived in the eastern part of the island who was concerned after the disturbances, and he had his wife and two young children leave their home in the East End to come stay at my home so there would be a relatively close proximity to him who was up at the um, uh, police compound. So it was a number of uh, situations Good. that were unusual and very disconcerting. Amen. Good, Good afternoon. <clears throat> my reason for being here is because at that particular moment, time in, in my life, I was working at Belco. And I can give you a rundown how it all started, because I was the first organizer, so to speak, of the linemen that were working for Belco. I myself was a mechanic in the garage, and I had contact with the linemen whenever they went out in the morning and whenever they came back at night or afternoon. So I was privy to most of their complaints. As a result of that, I saw the opportunity that we could do better if we became members of the BIU. So that is a short synopsis of what I have to say. Thank you. I'll pass it, Mike. You can say. Sister Ronnie Skinner, Mr. Phillip, and Mr. On yep. February the 2nd at 5.30, we will have what would take the form of a panel discussion with people that were there at that time, um, namely Mr. Wentworth, Christopher, Brother Audie, uh, Brother John Stowell, who was the Vice President of the Electrical Workers Union at that time, along with Mr. Andrew Birmingham, who is also on our committee, who was a police officer at the time and was one of the persons that were injured. So we will have them here and we've invited others that were also there at the 1965 disturbance. And we're inviting the audience participation because this is proven to be very wide, doing a lot of reading. I think I actually saw an article written by yourself, if it's you, yeah. <laughs> and because um, um, I was only four years old at the time, so I couldn't be there. <laughs> but um, um, so we, we were just hoping that it's we, we, we're not calling it a celebration, we're saying it's a reflection, and we're just inviting the whole body because it took a, it was a lot of people involved in this, not only those that were imprisoned or injured at that time, but also when we look at peace to people that were called to court and testified, people be amazed how their families were involved, because I even saw where Miss June Masters was one of those that was called to testify. So it's a big part of Bermuda's history that cannot be ignored no matter how we feel about it. So we are also inviting ex-police officers and the like, and the Ministerial Association, who played a big part at that time. And hopefully it will turn out to be a good night of history. Ronnie Burgess. I guess my question to you, Mr. Sure. <coughs> Yeah. Absolutely. 
Oh, that's an interesting question because a lot of people would say that we've come so far um, and to some degree we haven't come far at all um, because when you look at some of the things that the bulk of the workers faced in 1965, you can see that some of those things are in the workplace today are uh, in the organized as well as the, as well as the unorganized, recognizing that we do have collective bond agreements from time to time and we have employers that violate collective bond agreements. Um, we have the Employment Act 2000 that is supposed to protect the unorganized and from time to time we have employers violating that. So, you know, I think our plight today is not much different than what it was in 1965. We have to be consistent in what we're going to do on behalf of, 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 our, of our members and on behalf of, of, of organized labor. Okay. Yes, you'll get it. I didn't hear the first part of your question. Who, who do you hope that the community will, will be yeah. along with us and benefit from? Well, that's interesting because, you know, what we do, and this is my opinion, and, and some people might think it's a bit critical, but I think we take a lot for granted, um, you know, in life. And when we have, you know, a moment in history to reflect about what happened in 1965, and, and whilst I do want to understand people saying, well, you know what, you know, why is it something that you want to reflect on? It's something that we, we want to reflect on because, it, it, it's, it's a time in history that I think we need to look at. It's a time in history that, you know, if you don't know where you came from, you can't know where, you, where you're going. Too many times, you know, enough history is not taught in our schools and, and our young people don't know enough about the history to make sure that Bermuda history is taught in the schools and you understand exactly why it was a Balco strike in 1965, why you had a dock strike in 1959, and why you had a 1981. Those sort of things don't happen by accident. They happen because people are either had enough of what's happened in, in the work environment and those sort of things, and as a result of that, you have uprise, and that's what happened in 1965. Hmm? You, you know, that's, that's an interesting question, but I, I can take you way back to, you know, when we done the BIU history book, you know, that was done by an Ira Phillips in the room today. Uh, when we done the BIU history book and we've asked PLP ministers, we've asked OBA ministers to get that, you know, curriculum taught in the schools so we can teach uh, trade union history and those sort of things. And, and maybe what they should do is buy a book for every, whether it's a middle, middle school student or, or you know, um, high school student and give each one of them a, a BIU history book so they can read because recognizing that we take a lot for granted because, you know, those, those people are going to come to the work environment in the next three to five years, five to seven years, and they should know exactly if they're working in a unionized environment, exactly why they have vacation time or sick benefits or maternity benefits and those sort of things. And they weren't given because the employer felt, you know what, I woke up this morning, I'm going to go to heart, not only give my employees vacation pay, I'll give them sick pay. Those, those benefits were all fought for by organized labor, and as a result of that, as a result of that, result of that the unorganized labor also benefits from it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's up. That's part two. These, the, the, everybody here is going to disappear. I'm going to be here by myself. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess my question is about the the social conditions then sure. that made the um, that movement so successful. I mean, you managed to get people in who weren't weren't even part of the Bell Right. Right. Uh, my question is really about how how do, how does the social conditions then compare with what you observe today in your view? Okay. All I would say to you, um, I think that you should come to the event on February 2nd, and then you should hear those answers that you're looking for. Because I don't want to take, any, take away anything that's going to happen on February 2nd. Yeah, we just certainly don't want to do that. Sound yeah, but you got, you got some, but you know, you've heard from Brother Adi, you've heard from Mr. Christopher, you've heard from Brother John Stowe, and you've heard from Sister Ronnie. And I think that based on that, you know, we've got flyers out there. Uh, we will hopefully take out some ads to, to beef up the event for February 2nd. And I think for now, I think that's about all we want to say about the particular event.